Hello and welcome to our live stream. How can intrinsic molecular subtypes guide therapeutic decisions for breast cancer patients? Thank you for joining us. My name is Kai Taylor and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this live stream technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using your computer volume settings. The Q&A and polling tab is where you will ask your presenters questions. You will need to enter your first and your last name to participate in polls or to ask a question. To ask a question, click in the text box and type your question. When finished, press the enter key or click the paper airplane icon to send that question. All of your questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded in the order in which they are received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. During this presentation, you will see multiple choice polling questions. When the poll is active, it will automatically appear in the Q&A and polling window. To participate in the polls, please select the buttons to the left of your answer that you would like to submit. Uh, we are joined today by our moderator, Kelly Macom, Marcom, excuse me, Medical Director, Breast Cancer at Verisite, and our speakers, uh, Professor uh, Frederic uh, Penelt uh, Dorka, Dr. Uh, Oliver Traden, and Professor uh, Gillis Breyer, uh, three leading oncology experts from France. This time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Kelly, for opening remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kai, and thank you for setting the audience up for my French pronunciation as well. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so, Okay. All right. So uh, before we get started, I do need to read this disclaimer side. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Verisite and it's for educational purposes only. There is no CME credit uh, offered for this. Uh, the presentation will discuss scientific data on PAM50 that are of clinical interest, but they're not part of the ProSigna label. Uh, Off-label use isn't endorsed by Verisite and should not be considered as validated. It's intended for clinicians outside the United States, and please refer to the ProSigna package insert and local approvals and guidelines for the appropriate use of the test in your geography. Verisite and the Verisite logo and ProSigna are registered trademarks of Verisite Incorporated and its subsidiaries in the U.S. and selected countries. Encounter is the registered trademark of Nanostring Technologies and is used by Verisite under license. So without a very good morning and uh, afternoon or evening to you, wherever you may be, and thank you for joining the fourth in our series, webinar series focused on the utility of ProSigna. Sorry, the slides. Uh, okay, a second generation genomic transcriptomic test based on the PAM50 gene signature. And we hope that you find this and the subsequent events useful and insightful a lot of work has been put into making the content relevant to your practice, and as Kai has already established uh, and described, this is an interactive session and we warmly welcome any and all questions and feedback. And I'd encourage you to use Slido to communicate with us. We will have an open Q&A session at the end. If you weren't able to join us for the previous sessions, my name is Kelly Markham and I'm the Medical Director for Breast Cancer at Verisite. I'm part of a wider team who are here to help you, whether your question is clinical, scientific, or access related. Our aim for this webinar series is to demonstrate the clinical utility of ProSigna by building on the previous discussions in a narrative manner. During the first webinar, we summarized the key data and demonstrated the clinical utility of this technology in the clinic. And during the second session, professors Chuck Peru, Torsten Nielsen, and Martina Kirchner walked us through the PAM50 journey from its initial discovery and the description of the intrinsic subtypes by Chuck Peru to the clinically validated product that we know today as ProSigna and its practical local implementation. During the third webinar, Professor Fallowfield discussed the complexities of the communication between healthcare professionals and patients in the context of genomic testing. So for our conversation today, we will explore the ways in which the PAM50 molecular intrinsic subtypes can provide valuable insights for therapeutic decision making in the breast cancer field. So we're delighted to have three leading breast cancer experts from France. It's my duty and pleasure to introduce them. 
Uh, first, we'll have Professor Frederic Pinoyorka, who serves as Deputy President of the Unicancer Group since 2022. She is also General Director of the Jean Perrin Anti-Cancer Center in claremont ferrand and a Professor of Pathology at the University of Avern. She has conducted various biomarker-based research studies in breast cancer, colorectal, gastric, and lung cancer in relation to response to targeted therapies and immunotherapies. She is a member of several pathology and oncology societies, with her main areas of expertise being female cancers. She co-chairs the French Breast Guide Cancer Guidelines of the Nice St. Paul and Frederic uh, Penaliorca has more than 470 peer-reviewed publications and several books on female cancers and pathologic testing methods and issues. Our second speaker is Dr. Olivier Trodon. He's a medical oncologist in the Department of Medical Oncology at the Centre Lyon Burard in Lyon, France. He has served as chair of the department since 2020. He was a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada during a postdoc at the University of Toronto Princess Margaret Cancer Center. He's also involved in the Breast Cancer Translational Research Program at the Centre Leon Burard and has a large clinical practice. He leads many clinical and translational research projects on breast and gynecologic cancers. And then for our third speaker, we'll have Professor Gilles Ferrer, currently head of the Department of Medical Oncology at Centre Leon Burard and Vice Dean of the University of Lyon, France. He is also the current medical director of the Center Institute of the Hospice Civil de Lyon. He is known for having been the president of the cooperative group Gynico, the Groupe des Investigateurs Nationaux des Etudes des Cancers Oriens et de Seine, from 2013. He was also a member of the International Scientific Committee of the French National Cancer Institute. Professor Freire is known for being the president of the Monaco Age Oncologica and the co-president of the biennial Monescoque de Cancerologie. So, before we get started with the presentations, I invite you to scan the QR code uh, to participate in the poll questions that Professor Geoffrey will ask you while he presents several clinical cases. And uh, if you scan that now, we'll open Slido for you. And uh, I believe you can also post the questions through there as well. So with that, I'm now pleased to hand over to Professor Pino Yorka, who will discuss the development of the PAM-50 gene signature and the clinical relevance of intrinsic subtypes. Dr. Pino Yorka, I believe you can- Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for this very uh, kind uh, introduction. So this is my disclosures. So uh, when we have a breast cancer case, um, as pathologists, we will go through uh, what we call the basic tools. So um, look at the T and N parameters, so the tumor size and the level of node uh, involvement, if any. Um, then we will uh, give the breast cancer subtype and, and we will uh, uh, calculate, evaluate the grade the uh, Elston Ellis uh, grade. Then we will perform immunosochemistry to look at uh, hormone receptor status, progesterone and estrogen, the ER2 status by uh, immunosochemistry and sometimes also by in situ hybridization, and look at proliferation uh, using the Key67 uh, uh, antibody. We also evaluate the prognosis, looking on surgical specimen, uh, whether we have or not uh, vascular embolies at the periphery of uh, the lesion. So this is our basic tools, um, but uh, are they uh, enough uh, to uh, take care of our patients? Uh, since uh, 2000, we had our revolution in, in breast, uh, with uh, uh, the discovery by uh, Chuck Peru and Therese Sorley of the intrinsic molecular classification. Uh, this uh, uh, molecular classification will uh, separate uh, breast cancer uh, with the uh, expression of the uh, uh, estrogen receptor gene, ESR1. And what, what, what is our interest today is to look at the category of breast cancer that express uh, the estrogen uh, uh, receptor. Uh, and it has been uh, delineated by this uh, intrinsic molecular classification between two groups, 
uh, larger, the larger group that is a luminal A with, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, an excellent prognosis, and the luminal B with an intermediate prognosis. The other groups uh, uh, that were found by the intrinsic molecular classification were the basal-like and the ER2 uh, group with very poor prognosis. I remind you that in 2000, we were, we were before the trastuzumab era, so this was uh, reflecting the natural history of the ER2 breast cancer. This uh, uh, classification uh, uh, also gives us uh, a predictive uh, uh, value for the uh, luminal group because from uh, uh, the data from the uh, clinical uh, trial DBCG77B, uh, if we look at uh, uh, on the uh, upper uh, image uh, the category of the luminal A strict uh, uh, group, there was no benefit from chemotherapy and if we look uh, below uh, on, in the, the red curves, we have uh, we can see that in the non-luminal A group, the patient clearly benefit, benefited from uh, chemotherapy. So uh, this was showing us that this uh, um, intrinsic classification showing the biology of the tumor as a prognostic impact, but also a predictive impact for the, the benefit of chemotherapy. So uh, what do we do in routine practice? Uh, in routine practice, we try to approach this uh, uh, intrinsic molecular uh, classification that is a transcriptomic uh, classification, looking at gene expression using our basic tool of immunostochemistry. So we have guidelines trying to uh, de uh, differentiate luminal A from luminal B, looking at the expression of uh, progesterone receptor, looking at uh, the absence of expression of R2, proliferation, grade, and uh, we will see that it's not satisfactorily uh, correlated with the intrinsic classification. Uh, so we really need this intrinsic, intrinsic classification in our clinical practice. So it's the moment where I, I, I speak about PAM50. You will have a whole webinar uh, giving you the history, but briefly, in fact, so in 2000, uh, uh, Peru and Sorli used more than 70 Android genes and look at their expression uh, and, and, and found those uh, uh, differential expressions showing us luminal A, luminal B, basal-like, and R2 enrich. In 2009, uh, uh, PAM50 uh, shrinked, in fact, the, 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 this classification from 70, seven, uh, more than 700 genes to the expression of 50 genes. And it was developed by a consortium of four academic breast cancer experts, Chuck Peru, Matt Ellis, Thorsten Nielsen, and Philip Bernard. That in 2010, nanostring licenses the PAM50, uh, it was ex exclusivity, uh, and uh, derive uh, in 2013 the ProSigna uh, test, a breast cancer assay that is uh, FD approved in US and C marked in Europe and uh, Israel. So, what, what is the, the PAM50 and, 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 and how it, it, it is used in the ProSigna test? So in the ProSigna test, the first part is the PAM50 that will determine the genomic profile. Then we will add the clinical features. So uh, uh, nodal status, either node zero or node one to three. And this, then the gross tumor size, less than two centimeters or two centimeters or more. And it will impact on the, uh, the, the final score. Uh, it's in the algorithm. So in the algorithm, we have the ProSigna score, luminal A, luminal B, R2 enriched or basal-like, a proliferation score of 21 uh, genes and the uh, 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 clinical parameters. And, and, and this is translated for uh, uh, use with the patient in a, a, a report showing to the patient the, the risk of recurrence, the 10-year risk of recurrence, and then 
the uh, 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 the classification in V um, as a molecular subtype and the, the 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 risk of recurrence at 10 years. So uh, this is uh, shown here. So for for instance, for this patient, we can see that uh, she's in the low risk category with a score of 25. Uh, we are at a low risk until 40. The intermediate risk here, because the patient is uh, not negative, will be between 40 and 60. And after 60, uh, the patient is considered as high risk. And then on the lower part, you will see the, the risk. Uh, uh, so the, the probability, the 10 year probability of uh, distant recurrence. And for this patient, the, uh, for uh, the 10 year uh, uh, probability of risk of uh, distant recurrence is 4%. So molecular subtype, risk of recurrence, and risk group. So how I, I told you that it's not fully correlated with immunostochemistry. So this is uh, uh, an example here uh, in, in, uh, in this study. So if we start from the left, in the hormone receptor positive ER2 negative group, we have uh, 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 more than 80% uh, of the patients that will uh, uh, be in the luminal group. Luminal A is predominant and luminal B, but you can see that other patients are in the other categories, ER2 enriched in, in green or basal-like in uh, um, in uh, orange. In gray, uh, this is what is what was called initially the normal subtype. In fact, it's uh, when we have a low uh, tumor content, um, the, the signature will not be able to uh, capture the biology of the tumor, but will capture the biology of the microenvironment. So in fact, it's non-classified patients. Uh, now we don't have this category because we, we are able to pre-select correctly um, uh, areas of tumors with uh, a, a high cellularity. In the hormone receptor positive R2 positive group, uh, we still have uh, more than 50% of uh, uh, the uh, uh, patient with the tumor falling in the luminal group, luminal A or luminal B, 43% in the R2 enriched, and a few patients in, uh, because it was uh, uh, in 2019 in the normal group. If we look at the hormone receptor negative R2 positive, also with the PAM50, it's not the ProSigna test here, uh, you can see that we have a majority, uh, more than uh, 74%, that are in the R2 enriched, but we still have uh, patients falling into the luminal group or in the basal-like. And for the triple negative um, uh, breast cancer, 81% will be uh, in the basal, but we will have also patients in the R2 enriched or in the luminal B uh, group. So there is no 100% uh, um, correlation with, with what we uh, uh, use in immunostochemistry. Um, what, what is used also in immunostochemistry to separate luminal A from luminal B, so what we call the surrogate uh, classification, is the use of key 67 And here in, in this uh, study, uh, you can clearly see that if we use um, the 10% um, um, cutoff, uh, we still, uh, for key 67 we still have 30% of discordance. Uh, with luminal A and luminal B. And you can see, for instance, here that if we look uh, uh, on the top, if we look at the luminal A group, we still have uh, uh, almost 30% of the patients that are luminal A by molecular biology, but in fact have, have, have a key 67 between 21 and 30, and 15% and that will have, that will be luminal A but we'll have more than 30% of Ki67. So Ki67 is, is not uh, accurate enough to separate correctly luminal A from luminal B when we use immunostochemistry. And uh, um, if we look also at the uh, risk of recurrence for the tumor size, 
you can see that uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, if we look at a very low key 67, so zero between zero and 10%, we, st we ha only have 57% of uh, the patient with uh, ROR low. So meaning that we have a lot of patients with uh, ROR low with higher key 67 levels. And uh, uh, this is the same thing when the tumor is uh, more than two centimeters. Uh, we only have 66% of uh, uh, ROR low with a very low key 67. So key 67 has really a lot of limitations uh, 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 to be able to separate luminal A from luminal B. This is highlighted also in uh, other uh, studies with uh, reclassification with the use of uh, uh, PAM50 um, between PAM50 and immunostochemistry. As you can see here on this uh, um, image, so we have a total of 43% of the cases that were classified either luminal A or luminal B like by immunostochemistry that were reclassified when we uh, uh, look at the PAM50 results. Some cases were reclassified from luminal B to luminal A, 58%, so a high number of patients. Uh, those patients could have been candidate to uh, chemotherapy, but in fact, they are clear luminal A, so really hormone sensitive patients. And on the other end, we have 18 patients uh, that were classified luminal A by immunostochemistry and uh, uh, were in fact luminal B by molecular biology. And the last study I would like to share with you, it's an, 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 an other study that showed that we had an upgrade uh, from luminal uh, um, uh, A-like by immunostochemistry to uh, prosinia luminal B in 17% of the cases, even if we use uh, the grade. And uh, for the um, immunostochemistry luminal B uh, by uh, immunostochemistry were downgraded by uh, uh, molecular biology to luminal A uh, in around 40% of the cases. So it's really very important because we cannot rely, uh, I, I hope that you uh, kept my message, uh, we cannot rely uh, uh, on immunostochemistry to separate correctly luminal A from luminal B, and we really need to have the PAM50 uh, um, uh, evaluation. Then I would like to share with you a, a study looking at uh, uh, the uh, clinical value of the intrinsic subtypes and the comparison with the oncotype DX. So this has been performed uh, in the TransAttack study. In the TransAttack study, um, they had uh, 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 patient samples for uh, 774 patients. Um, a majority of them were not negative, but we also had 183 patients with one to three positive lymph nodes. All the patients were menopausal and they were treated uh, either by tamoxifen or by anastrozole. Uh, we had uh, in this study a wide range of clinical pathological features, uh, tumor size, uh, grade, and age. And they compared they look at uh, uh, the uh, uh, BCI, uh, the uh, recurrent scores of the oncotype DX, the Procinia ROR, ROR, sorry, and the EpiClean, uh, so the endopredict uh, test. And uh, uh, they also look at uh, EHC4, so the combination of uh, immunostochemistry and uh, also the, 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 the clinical, uh, clinical score. And they limited the study to the zero uh, to three uh, lymph, uh, positive lymph nodes. What we see here, if we look in the node negative population, uh, looking at uh, uh, the risk uh, uh, of recurrence uh, to ten, uh, 10 years, you can see that the best performance were obtained with uh, uh, the ROR, so with the Procinia test. Uh, and it was uh, better, uh, the better results than the recurrent score, than the EpiClean or than the BCI that were um, uh, uh, 
the two la the two last were better than the recurrence score. And if we um, uh, uh, look at uh, uh, what we had, we really can see that uh, uh, looking at what have I highlighted in purple uh, uh, the, with the ROR, we clearly have a group with an excellent prognosis. And we can see that the high risk group is really very different and is really also showing the patient with the worst prognosis when they receive only hormonal treatment. And we have the intermediate uh, uh, group uh, here. If we look at uh, uh, the risk of recurrence after five years, so in, in this trial, the, the patient uh, received uh, only five years of hormonal treatment. You can see also that uh, uh, for the prediction of the risk of relapse after, after five years, the best performance were obtained with the uh, uh, Procinia test. Um, and you can see also in the curves that it's clearly uh, uh, shown with uh, uh, a very uh, sharp difference between the low risk and uh, the high risk. And in fact, the intermediate risks were not so far uh, uh, from uh, the uh, uh, low risk uh, patients. And if you look, for instance, at the recurrence score, it's uh, the B uh, uh, curves, you can see that there is not a clear um, uh, separation of the curves between the low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk patients. The Procigna uh, had uh, also uh, uh, quite good uh, uh, evaluation of the low risk of recurrence, but you can see that uh, uh, in terms of showing the patient that will uh, um, uh, recur, it's uh, the curves are different from the uh, ROR. If we look at uh, uh, the uh, ASCO uh, guidelines that were uh, released uh, in uh, 2022, in front of a patient with an early stage hormone receptor positive R2 negative, you are, if you have doubts about indicating chemotherapy, a genomic test can help you make that decision. So, what is new is the difference between postmenopausal and premenopausal. So, in postmenopausal patients with N0 or PN1, so uh, one to three positive lymph nodes, if we have a genomic low or intermediate risk, no chemotherapy, and a genomic high risk, chemotherapy. In a premenopausal patient with a PN0, a genomic low risk, no chemotherapy, a genomic intermediate or high risk, chemotherapy, or uh, LHRH, RH, or both for uh, the patients. As I showed you uh, in the uh, ProSigna test, we have an intermediate risk group. So let's, let's deep uh, deep dive into this uh, intermediate group. So um, if we look at this uh, intermediate group, uh, that is, as I said, between uh, 20 and, and 40, in fact, you, you see that um, only, first of all, if we look at the luminal A, only 0.3% of luminal A tumor will fall into the ROR-I group. You can see the three small points here. Um, the ROR low group includes only luminal A tumors, and both luminal A and luminal B tumors will fall into the ROR intermediate, and the majority of the luminal B will be in the high risk group. And if we look at the basal like or R2 and rich, they are also majority in the high risk group, and almost none of them. Uh, are in the uh, intermediate, and none, on, none of them are in the low risk group. So, um, how can we predict outcome in this uh, in this uh, category? So, we can see that uh, for the patient not receiving chemotherapy, there is a clear difference between the luminal A and the luminal B or the non-luminal group, so R2 and rich or, or basal-like. And we see the uh, uh, intermediate uh, uh, prognosis of the luminal A, luminal B, non-luminal. If we look on the right for this patient, 60 years old, 
uh, 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 non-specific breast cancer, 1.5 centimeter, not negative, but grade three, ER 100, progesterone 90, uh, ER2 negative, and with a key 67, 20 percent, so considered as a high uh, key 67. In fact, you can see that this patient will fall into the intermediate risk group with a score of 56, so very close to the high risk. The subtype will be a luminal B, and there is a 13 percent probability of distant recurrence. In my hospital, this kind of patient with this type of result will uh, be a candidate for, for uh, chemotherapy because she's luminal B. So the, in this intermediate group, the, the knowledge of um, the intrinsic subtype will be one factor that will uh, uh, help us to uh, take the therapeutic decision. So in fact, this intermediate risk category is really reflecting a continuum of risk. Risk is always a continuous variable. It's not a binary function. And when you have a test saying low risk, high risk with a cutoff, uh, the patient with uh, um, a tumor with a score close to the cutoff uh, are, are, are in an intermediate uh, category. Uh, they are not, you know, uh, if I take the example of Andopredix, 3.2 or 3.4. Uh, they are very close to the cutoff that is 3.3. So um, all those ge genomic signatures, they have a risk curve based on a continuous risk score. So at one point, there, there are categories, but you, we always have to look to the exact numbers. And, and we, have a category, we have categories of patients that are considered as intermediate. And in fact, in the absence of an intermediate risk category, patients are artificially assigned to either low risk or high risk group of relapse. And, and we have to take to look clearly where uh, are our patients when we look at those uh, cutoffs. And the more informed decision will be supported by the intrinsic subtypes that we have with the prostigna test, and that is really very helpful for us. Also looking at the menopausal status, the patient age, the history and the comorbidities, the patient choice, and other factors that will be uh, discussed. And, and that's why also we always um, discuss those cases in the multidisciplinary uh, tumor boards. With uh, that, I will uh, uh, now uh, give the floor to uh, Olivier. So Olivier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frédéric. Um, I'm Olivier Trudan, a medical oncologist uh, in Lyon, Santé en Béra. And uh, uh, the main topic of my uh, clinical case is to discuss uh, adjuvant chemotherapy in, in two different uh, uh, patients of mine. Um, at two times, at three times, I, I will give you uh, questions. And uh, if you uh, you're free to, to answer those questions uh, to see if you will do chemotherapy for these two patients. So the idea is to see if uh, this intrinsic molecular subtype will uh, help us to guide the chemotherapy in the ACE adjuvant setting. So the first clinical case so this is a 60-year-old uh, female uh, Caucasian uh, patient, uh, obviously postmenopausal, and uh, she had no family history of breast or ovarian cancer. She was a taxi driver. She had three kids. Uh, they, they don't have any history of cancer either. Uh, her husband is not uh, uh, frequently at home, uh, so uh, she's quite alone to uh, to face this uh, breast cancer. She's very active in an association taking care of the homeless, and um, she really wants to be able to continue uh, her work and continue to carry her for her family uh, and for other people. So she is very active and. And she has a, 
uh, 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 breast cancer. She's non-smoker, but her, firm, her medical history included occasional hot burn. Uh, she had uh, fibroadenoma in the right breast, with penin tumor. Uh, she undergone excisional biopsy 10 years ago. She is not taking any medication so far. Uh, she had occurred menarche at 12 years of age and uh, she's postmenopausal. She didn't receive any hormonal replacement therapy. So she was found to have a breast lump, a palpable mass in the left uh, outer quadrant of the breast. The tumor is around three centimeter in the largest diameter. The mammographic images detected this uh, 25 density mass in the left breast. And uh, you have uh, here the image of the breast MRI showing this mass uh, in the left outer quadrant of the left breast, obviously uh, uh, a malignant tumor. She had a PET CT that uh, uh, didn't show any uh, uh, image for uh, lymph node or metastasis. And she had a tumor biopsy showing an invasive lobular carcinoma, grade two with ER positive 80% of the cells, PGR positive for 30% of the cells, R2 negative, and the K67 is about 20%. So she had a lumpectomy with a sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure. And this is the pathological examination. Indeed, it's a, a invasive lobular carcinoma, grade two, with the K67 of 18%. The tumor was 30 millimeters in greatest dimension, no definitive lymphovascular invasion, no lobular carcinoma in situ, still ER positive, PR positive, R2 negative breast cancer. And one lymph node was positive for micrometastasis, 300 micrometers from the two lymph node removed. So with that, who would consider adjuvant chemotherapy, chemotherapy in this situation? Again, three centimeter tumor, grade two, lobular carcinoma, ER positive, not negative, except that there is micrometastasis in this lymph node. So it's not PN0, but pn -MIC. Um I think you can vote at that time with your QR code. Olivier, can I make a comment? For sure. <laughs> uh, my comment would be, uh, the question is, would you prescribe adjuvant chemotherapy or would you only consider, I mean, think about adjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, I didn't catch your question. The question is, do I consider the chemo or do I prescribe the chemo? Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, if I consider the chemo, I will order the chemo for this patient. I mean, after having a discussion with the patient. Okay. So we have only five, six votes. Can we wait for minute to have all the buttons then so so far it's 50 50. so again it, it's a postmenopausal women 
Okay, and Olivier, the, may I ask yeah. you another question? Sure. <laughs> and uh, did you use, for instance, uh, the, the predict breast estimation? And how could you, how would you classify this patient in terms of uh, high risk or intermediate risk, and uh, and in terms of uh, chemo uh, benefit? Uh, so in my routine, I, I don't use this kind of tool to order chemo. I just follow uh, our local and the regional recommendation. And uh, uh, for this specific uh, case, uh, the, recommendation, the recommendation is to do chemo for this patient because, uh, because of the size of the tumor, because of the grade, uh, and because of the microinvasion uh, within the lymph node. So uh, I, I don't use other tools uh, than the recommendation I have. What will you do, Gilles? Oh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the point is that we have some uh, clinical and, and uh, pathological predictors, and we try to have this, uh, 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 this overall synthesis uh, in order to, to classify the tumor in a high or intermediate risk group. And I think that uh, um, we had the uh, adjuvant online and now we have a predict and we, we, we have some limitations, of course, with those tools, but they, they only give you an integrated estimation of the risk and the benefit. So I, I think it, it, it might be helpful in, in some cases. Looks like we have some responses. I, I am curious. So, uh, um, would either of you be influenced by the, the histology? I mean, we certainly are emphasizing the importance of genomics here, but the lobular histology um, weigh with you at all in this consideration? I think we can also ask Frederick if uh, the lobular type mm -hmm. of cancer yes. will modify something in your institution to give chemo or not in, in the situation again it's a three centimeter tumor yes so i i i uh, we are before the era of uh, molecular signatures we always had a lot of discussion in uh, in, uh, in the multidisciplinary tumor board concerning the lobular carcinoma um i was almost always uh, against uh, going to chemotherapy for those patients especially with even with large tumors, because we had a, a lot of, when they were classical lobular carcinoma, of course, not the pleomorphic subtypes, but the classical, because when we look uh, uh, the uh, neoadjuvant data, those patients almost never go to complete uh, pathological response or sometimes don't respond at all or have very uh, uh, small uh, shrinkage of the tumor. So clearly they didn't uh, seem to be uh, chemo sensitive, but uh, when we were discussing that, so before the era of the molecular signature, we always had the discussion. Yes, but the stage is high. There is vascular involvement because usually those tumors they uh, grow very slowly. So uh, when they are when we, they are clinically uh, detected, usually we have uh, we can have uh, uh, um, lymph node, uh, sorry, uh, vascular involvement or, or uh, embolies. So it's always the discussion between the biology of the tumor and the stage. And I think that now that we have the molecular signature, it's something that is very, uh, very much more interesting uh, uh, because we, we, we will see what will be the, the, the intrinsic subtype of this tumor. And I will bet that it's uh, luminal A. <laughs> Good job, Frederick. Um, <laughs> so if we can move to the next slide, because it's not working for me. So basically it's 50-50. Uh, so we did this uh, <laughs> prosigna test uh, for this specific patient. And, and again, it, it's, a, it's a patient of mine. So I, I know her very well and she was very happy. Uh, because again, she's very active and she wants to continue to care to others. So um, uh, the risk of recurrence for her is 24, and it's uh, definitely a luminal A breast cancer. So in this situation, uh, I think nobody recommend chemotherapy for this kind of patient because the risk of relapse is very low in this situation. Uh, what we can also discuss together uh, is uh, if... Uh, this uh, recurrence score uh, was around 35 or 40. Um, and if it's still 
a luminal A breast cancer, uh, would you recommend uh, chemotherapy? And in my institution, uh, even if this uh, uh, risk of uh, recurrence is intermediate, and uh, Frederick discussed that previously, uh, even if this uh, risk is intermediate, I will not recommend chemotherapy for this kind of patient if it's still a luminal A breast cancer. Because again, I think like uh, Frederick just said, uh, the, the benefit from the chemotherapy in this situation is probably uh, very low. So. Um, um, uh, I, I will ask Julie if you agree with that, but uh, yes. uh, a recurrence score under 60 in this situation uh, would orient the decision to no chemotherapy, just a radiation therapy and endocrine therapy for at least five years. What do you think, Julie? Yes, I agree with you, Olivier, because uh, there are very consistent data showing almost no benefits for luminal A tumors. So I would uh, I, I would agree uh, with you. So this is one piece of data in the next slide. Sorry, it doesn't work. Mm. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is exactly what uh, Gilles said, that this is one uh, of the data showing that there is um, no, no very good uh, answer to the question, but the prognosis is very good for this kind of patient who is luminal A and low risk tumor. This is the, the data from the ABCHGA trial uh, with, three, with treatment with uh, endocrine therapy alone in this uh, prospective Try showing that the luminal A is doing very well at 10 years because the 10 year disease free survival uh, is almost 94% uh, uh, for the luminal A uh, breast subtype. And uh, for the low uh, group uh, of risk, uh, the 10 year disease free survival is almost 97%. So uh, I don't think with this kind of prognosis we need chemo in this situation. Uh, let's move to the second case. So, uh, a 72 woman, uh, also Caucasian, uh, she's uh, obviously postmenopausal. Again, she uh, had no history, uh, family history of breast cancer, ovarian cancer. She was a teacher. She's overweight and uh, she had an episode of acute heart failure 10 years ago. Uh, she had been diagnosed with hypertension and she had treatment uh, for this hypertension. Uh, she had also a left ventricular evaluation uh, by ultrasound showing a, a good uh, left ventricular function uh, at uh, uh, 52%. Uh, this is her mammogram uh, after the biopsy and the clip and uh, the physical examination revealed a mass around one centimeter in greatest dimension in the left breast. Uh, she had no lymph node, palpable lymph node, and so she had a tumor biopsy showing a moderately differentiated invasive ductal carcinoma, grade 3, 3 plus 3 plus 3, ER positive for 60% of the cells, PGR positive for 60% of the cell, R2 negative, 1 plus, K67, 20%. So she had a lumpectomy with a sentinel lymph biopsy showing this invasive ductal carcinoma plus the CIS. Uh, the size of the invasive tumor was 11 millim uh, millimeters. It was a grade three without lymphovascular invasion, still ER positive, PR positive, R2 negative breast cancer. Two lymph nodes were removed and there was no invasion. So again, this uh, one centimeter, grade three, 72 year old women, ER positive, PN0 tumor. Would you recommend adjuvant chemotherapy in this situation? Basically because of the grade, 
it's probably a highly proliferative tumor. Would you recommend chemotherapy in this situation? I think you can vote right now. And uh, during the vote, the vote, probably we can discuss with Jill. Uh, he's an expert in uh, geriatric oncology, and uh, this uh, patient is 72. Uh, she is in good health. She has no major comorbidity except hypertension. Would you recommend chemo in this situation? And I don't have any tool uh, to to see if it is, there is a, a bad diagnostic except uh, what I showed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Olivier, it's a it's very, very interesting case because we can have a lot of discussion about it. And uh, I will be very uh, uh, interested in seeing, the in having the results of the molecular signature because uh, I will... Uh, uh, the problem, it will take two weeks to have the answer. So we have to discuss because we need to wait for two weeks to have uh, the ProSigna score. And what you mean is that it, it would it would be too late for you uh, to fall from surgery and you you need to have a decision immediately is it what you mean no i mean uh, i mean uh, we have uh, we need to have this discussion right now because the patient is uh, um i would say uh, uh, wants to have your opinion right now because uh, she will leave uh, in two days from now and uh, she wants to have a trip uh, in North America uh, in, two, in two days from now. And so she wants to have your opinion right now and I will call her in two weeks to give her the ProSigna score. Okay. And now uh, I think the, the, the poll is, uh, is stable. So, uh, because I would not, not like to influence um, <laughs> the audience, uh, my personal opinion would be no, no chemotherapy. And I think uh, we, but, but, but also, uh, I think that there, there was, uh, that we have some re molecular results in this patient. And I think I know the results. So, uh, <laughs> you know it. That's why, that's why it's so interesting to discuss because I would say no. Because there is no proof of uh, chemotherapy efficacy in uh, uh, women over 70 years old with luminal tumors. And uh, perhaps we'll discuss the results of another, uh, of a very recent trial named the Jericho trial. Jericho, yes. And, uh, and uh, I think the first question we perhaps we, we could ask is. Mm -hmm. Do you consider that this case uh, needs um, a molecular signature? Uh, would you would you recommend to perform a molecular signature or not? Uh, and that's why it's it's interesting to uh, to discuss about Jericho Aster. Yeah, I, I agree with this question. It's a very important question, and again, it's it's, it's one of my patients. So I I, I did re, uh, order the Proxignia for this patient because of the grade. Uh, and uh, uh, um, at the time I, I, I saw her initially the patient, uh, uh, I think she was a candidate for chemo. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in oncogeriatry, but uh, I, I, I think she, she is eligible for a chemo, for an adjuvant chemo. Uh, she's only 72. Um, and again, a grade three tumor may may relapse uh, in the next couple of of years so um that's why i, I do the test so maybe we, we can switch to uh this the prosigna i did for this patient and again i'm not very comfortable with the slide because it's not switching can i have the next slide please see you yeah, whoops, there, no, previous one. Okay, so this is the prosigna for this patient. So it's a highly proliferative tumor and it's a luminal B tumor and the, the risk of relapse is considered to be high. Uh, the score is 73. So in my institution for this kind of patient, I will order the adjuvant chemo because this is a luminal B tumor with a high risk of relapse. Um, maybe we, we can discuss this results uh, regarding um, the Jericho 
11 data. Uh, again, maybe Gilles, you should be uh, able to discuss the data of the Jericho 11. My understanding of this data is that if there is uh, a good clinical uh, option for chemotherapy, and if the genomic test uh, oriented uh, uh, for chemotherapy, uh, we should order the chemo because in this population there is still a benefit of doing an adjuvant chemotherapy uh, what do you think Jim? okay very very interesting and perhaps i would like to uh to briefly remind uh the, the people who are uh, uh, attending this session uh the the design of the trial of the Jericho trial so uh this trial included uh women over 70 years old with uh, uh, hormone receptor positive tumors who were candidates potential candidates to chemotherapy and uh, having um uh, n plus or n zero tumors um and uh, uh in those uh, uh patients the the investigators performed a molecular signature, which was quite different from a prosigna, but it doesn't matter. There was this molecular signature allowed uh, the investigators to separate the patients between uh, high risk and low risk. And uh, when the, the, the patients had the low risk, they received hormone therapy only. And when they had a high risk, they were randomized between hormone therapy and chemo versus hormone therapy. And the, the main uh, endpoint in this study was overall survival, which is very, very useful. It was very good to have this trial with the uh, overall survival as the main, as the principal endpoint. And uh, at the end, uh, unfortunately, uh, or, or not perhaps, <laughs> the results of the study were negative. There was no benefit um, in terms of overall survival by doing chemotherapy. However, when you analyze the results in intent to treat, uh, you have no benefit. But when you analyze the results in uh, per protocol, uh, you have some benefit. And I think I'm not sure that this trial make our interpretations easier because I have discussed with uh, various colleagues, Olivier and others, and uh, I have noted uh, many different point of views points of view, sorry, uh, about the conclusions that we can draw uh, from this trial. Personally, I will, I will give you my opinion, but it's only my opinion. I think that between 70 years old and 80 years old, uh, in fit women uh, with no geriatric problem identified, it's probably okay to have the same uh, attitude as for younger patients. And here we have a patient who is only 72 i don't think she's uh, absolutely different from a patient of uh, from a 68 year old patient for instance okay I, I th so i think that olivier is probably right to uh, to have discussed uh, uh, chemotherapy and to have performed this uh, molecular signature given that this patient probably have a very long uh, life expectancy but on the other hand i think that over uh, 80 years old, I think it's very debatable to uh, to prescribe an adjuvant chemotherapy in those uh, very old people. That that That's my point of view. Excellent. Thank you, Gilles. So I will move to the next question. And so the next question is basically, what would you do for this specific case if the risk for this patient, it's again, a luminal B, breast cancer, but the risk is now intermediate. Can we switch to the next? So again, the, the score is now, let's say, 55, for instance. It's still a luminal B breast cancer. Would you recommend chemo for this situation? So, Gilles, the question is, if the risk is different, it's an intermediate risk, uh, would, you rec would you do a chemo for this patient? So I, I will let perhaps our colleagues... Uh, they will vote, vote uh, uh, and we'll see. So for the, the previous question, the answer was basically yes. We will see for 
this specific question. Frederick, do you have any uh, idea what would you, you do in your institution? We will have a lot of discussion, <laughs> probably, because she's luminal B, so... Uh, but then you will go through the risk benefit for the patient. Um, and uh, I probably discuss with uh, the, the, the oncocardiologist also, look at the type of chemo, you have a lot of discussion, but st still she has a, a grade three and, and a, a luminal B tumor. So uh, I don't know exactly, I, you know, without- I, I, don't, have, I, I don't have the answer neither. Uh, I don't have the answer neither. I believe I think she was yeah. high risk, so uh, you didn't have to- uh... <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's correct. I mean, because she is high risk uh, in, in this yes. reference uh, score, uh, I'm quite comfortable uh, of doing the chemo for her specifically. But uh, um, honestly, uh, if the score is intermediate, I, I don't know how to manage that uh, in my clinic. So probably uh, the discussion would be uh, uh, there is probably a benefit uh, from the chemo in your situation, but uh, I agree with you that probably uh, the heart function uh, would have to be uh, uh, carefully monitored. Uh, probably I, I, I will ask uh, a geriatrician or oncogeriatric uh, uh, doctor to to give his opinion. Um, I, I would not order anthracycline and maybe taxanolone may be uh, an option for her. Um, so 10 people vote and 70% of them will order chemo uh, for, um, I don't have the answer. So I think uh, we need more data to uh, to answer those kind of questions. And if I can have the next slide. Oh, Olivier, just, just a small comment. That, that's why yeah. I uh, I uh, told you about uh, uh, predict breast because uh, I think that in this situation I have some similar examples in uh, among my patients. Uh, the the benefit of the, the chemotherapy benefit should be uh, around two point five three uh, percent maximum, um, perhaps less. Uh, that's why perhaps it's 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 interesting to have a, a shared decision making, uh, and uh, sometimes I, I use it to explain to my patients. You know, uh, I will have to treat uh, perhaps hundred patients to uh, uh, to save uh, two or three patients. Are you among those two or three? I don't know, but the probability is low, um, and I think it's. Uh, um, on the score, it's very difficult because we we don't have we don't have data, we don't have a level of evidence. But uh, um, if I if I prescribe a chemotherapy to this patient, I would uh, I, I, I need to have very strong arguments. So I, I don't think I would prescribe chemo uh, with an intermediate risk. Okay, that, that's why we need the data from the Optima trial. So I just remind you the design of this uh, Optima trial. Uh, basically, you have a prosigna test uh, for the, for those kind of patients, um, and if the raw uh, score is under sixty, uh, so it's a low score and intermediate score, uh, the patient uh, will have endocrine therapy alone, and uh, if uh, the score, the risk of relapse is uh, more than sixty. Uh, the patient will have chemo uh, uh, and uh, endocrine therapy. The primary endpoint of this trial is the non inferiority uh, uh, regarding invasive digital car, um, disease free survival. And uh, we will be happy to have the data to discuss uh, uh, this kind of, of clinical case. Uh, there is also another trial uh, called Optima Young for uh, younger people. Um, so with that, I think we can switch to the next talk. Jill, uh, I think it's your turn. But it, I think it's your last slide, perhaps, about this Optima. Is, it, this is just the main criteria of the uh, Optima trial. Uh, but I think we can switch to the next talk. OK, thank you very much, Olivier. Uh...
I think that uh, the, this Optima trial, uh, to, to be honest, I think it's a, it's a very good uh, scientific uh, attitude to uh, randomize the signature itself. Um, it's uh, it's more difficult to uh, to have a positive study at the end, but I think it's uh, it's really honest. Uh, that's what I wanted to underline. And so um, this last talk. Uh, uh, deals with uh, some uh, atypical um, use of uh, of the signature. I mean, not necessarily uh, luminal tumors, but also triple negative tumors and uh, how to enrich tumors, but mainly in research protocols and not uh, in routine practice and also in the neoadjuvant setting. Uh, I'm trying to move to the next slide, but unfortunately, okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Just to remind you that uh, uh, there is a, a, a huge number of uh, studies uh, contributing to uh, to validate uh, the PAM50 and then the ProSigna uh, signature, ProSigna being uh, PAM50 plus the clinical predictors. But basically, we have uh, three sets of data. We have the trans attack uh, project, uh, and I, uh, may I remind you that attack was a, a randomized trial in the, in the adjuvant setting where anastrozole was compared uh, to tamoxifen, and this study was positive. And ABCSG, the Austrian trial eight, was a switch uh, trial in which uh, the patients received the five years of tamoxifen or. Uh, two or three years of tamoxifen followed by two or three years of an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, and we also have a big uh, Danish cohort, which is not a randomized trial, but a cohort. Uh, and uh, we will see that in this cohort, we have a lot of uh, intermediate and high risk patients and mainly node positive patients. Which is very important for, for the validation of the signature. And uh, we have a lot of uh, studies uh, assessing not only the value of the signature in the, treat the adjuvant treatment of luminal tumors, but also in many other situations and, uh, and also uh, dealing with the long-term uh, prognosis of, uh, of those patients, which, uh, which is really useful. Um, the next slide. Okay, so uh, as it was already mentioned uh, largely by, by uh, Frédéric, uh, in, in both uh, TransATTAC and NBCSG8 uh, studies, uh, we can see that uh, the, the very long-term uh, prognosis of patients uh, with uh, initially considered as low risk is absolutely confirmative. And uh, you can see here that low-risk patients remain at low risk uh, over 10 years. And this is also true uh, for node positive patients, because in node positive patients, we have 40% of those patients who are truly uh, at low or intermediate risk. And you can see that in terms of prognosis, low in intermediate risk uh, have a similar uh, behavior uh, in, you know, uh, in the long term uh, period uh, uh, as uh, compared to the higher risk uh, and uh, you, you can here see, easily see the difference. Next slide. If I can have the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, both in uh, node negative patients and in node positive patients, uh, um, in terms of distance, relapse-free uh, survival, we have a, a huge difference in terms of prognosis in favor of luminal A, luminal A tumors, which means that not only luminal A tumors have the, the best prognosis, but also they have the lowest sensitivity uh, to chemotherapy. And in the initial work of uh, Peru and Solier, we can see that uh, luminal B prognosis is closer to the triple negative breast cancer prognosis uh, rather than the luminal A, of course, which is largely better. Next slide. Well, I mentioned this uh, Danish cohort uh, in which uh, uh, a huge number of patients, more than 2,500 patients, uh, among, among those patients, more than 100 around 100 and 1,400 patients had a node involvement 
but also other poor prognostic parameters, such as uh, lymphovascular invasion, for instance. And those patients received hormone therapy, five years of endocrine therapy. And so uh, we here we have a, a good model to uh, assess the prognostic value of uh, prosigna among those intermediate and high risk patients. Next slide. And interestingly enough, uh, both in uh, node negative and node positive patients, you can see that uh, PAM50 uh, uh, can in individualize uh, a, a, a small, relatively small subgroup of patients at very low risk. I mean, less than 5% risk of relapse or long-term risk of relapse uh, uh, in patients without node involvement, but also patients with one lymph node or two uh, lymph node involved, lymph nodes involved. And uh, that, that's really interesting to see that in this group, you probably, the, the patient probably don't need any uh, uh, chemotherapy and perhaps no extension, no prolongation of, uh, of uh, hormone therapy. Next slide. And uh, similarly, um, when you uh, look at the long-term prognosis of patients uh, with luminal A tumors and luminal B tumors, you can see this, uh, this uh, important difference, uh, the prognosis of luminal A tumors remaining good at long-term with less than 10% uh, risk of, uh, uh, of relapse even in patients with uh, with uh, node involvement. Next slide. So uh, in the particular subgroup of uh, triple negative breast cancer, uh, you can see that, uh, of course, the majority of patients have basal-like tumors, but some patients have uh, uh, non uh, basal-like uh, tumors and sometimes luminal, sometimes normal-like, um, a subgroup we don't know uh, uh, exactly the, the significance. Next. Next slide, please. And so, uh, oh, no, previous one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and uh, uh, in the in the, the particular uh, setting of uh, of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, we we have here this confirmation that uh, luminal B tumors are significantly more responsive with a higher rate of uh, of PCR, but also of tumor response as uh, compared to uh, the basal-like phenotype or the HER2 enriched uh, phenotype. Next. And so what is really important, I think, is that uh, the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy appears uh, clearly uh, limited to uh, luminal B tumors, as you can see in particular regarding overall survival in, in the Danish cohort. We have no difference in terms of overall survival in uh, patients with luminal A tumors receiving, uh, 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 receiving chemotherapy. And uh, and uh, which uh, which is clearly independent uh, from uh, node involvement or even tumor size, uh, even in uh, in uh, tumors of more than five centimeters in the largest diameter. Next, thank you. Um, another potential area of interest. We are here uh, in the Mona Lisa trials, so uh, in the metastatic setting. Uh, and uh, we can see here, of course, th those are exploratory data, but we can see that there is a difference uh, in terms of uh, uh, the benefit, uh, which is due to uh, ribociclib, and uh, this benefit appears higher uh, in patients with how to enrich tumors. Uh, uh, we know that those tumors have a, have a poorer prognosis, but also in patients with luminal B tumors, but no difference uh, in patients with uh, basal-like tumors and uh, luminal A tumors, perhaps because in luminal A tumors, uh, the, the, the tumors have a, a high uh, sensitivity to hormone therapy. Next. 
Uh, in this uh, in interesting uh, trial, the alternate trial, uh, patients were included with the uh, big tumors, T2 to uh, T4, and they received neoadjuvant uh, hormone therapy, and uh, there was a randomization between uh, ir uh, uh, aromatase inhibitor alone or fulvestrant or the combination of, bo of both. And um, uh, the, the patients had a further biopsy uh, showing uh, the PI-67 downstaging or not, and in the absence of decrease of PI-67 uh, at, at week four or, or 12, they received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But most interesting is this part of the, uh, of the figure and uh, the, the patients with the modified PP score, a favorable uh, modified PP score continued with hormone therapy uh, alone after surgery and uh, patient with a non-favorable uh, PP received uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. So very interesting trial based on the uh, on a window of opportunity uh, regarding hormone therapy at the early phase of, uh, of the, the treatment. Next. And uh, in this trial, we had, uh, so we had some, some data with, the, uh, with the, 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 the luminal uh, A and B subtypes. And uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, more uh, patients sensitive to hormone therapy uh, in the luminal A uh, subgroup. And uh, we have uh, uh, better results with the combination of, uh, of fulvestrant and anastrozole and in luminal B uh, tumors, which uh, perhaps, perhaps are have a lower uh, sensitivity to hormone therapy, which uh, could help to explain the interest of the combination. Next. Here you have uh, a, a variety of trials uh, regarding uh, new hormone, new agents in the field of hormone therapy. Uh, we have uh, CERDs. Uh, the, uh, I, re I can remind you that fulvestrin is probably the first CERD uh, we, we have, but we have many other drugs such as amsenestrant, camisestrant, elacestrant. You, uh, certainly you know that the Emerald trial was, uh, was uh, positive, uh, uh, showing the superiority of elacestrant over uh, investigators' choice uh, uh, hormone therapy, but we also have uh, new serums uh, which are uh, under uh, evaluation, such as uh, lazofoxifen, bazodoxifen, and all, uh, many other molecules which uh, which are not uh, not uh, showed on this uh, on this table. The point is, in in some of those trials, we have a look at some biomarkers such as ESR1 is probably the most interesting biomarker to consider now. But uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, likely that uh, some molecular signatures such as uh, Pro Procinia could have an interest in um, assessing the population, which is uh, more likely to uh, uh, able to benefit from from those new agents. Next. Uh, another uh, area uh, for uh, of uh, assessment for uh, and of research for the, the the molecular signature. If we uh, we have uh, uh, you know a, a particular indication which which is capsaicin uh, in uh, in triple negative breast cancer after uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in patients uh, uh, whose tumors did not uh, show a, a complete a pathological response, and as you know, uh, capsidamine is better uh, uh, than uh, than uh, simply follow up in those uh, patients. Next, and what we can see is that this benefit is probably restricted to uh, the population of uh, non basal tumors, um, and uh, we we, uh, we 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 don't have uh, any benefit in the in in the basal like. Uh, subgroup of uh, of tumors, so it's uh, it's an exploratory analysis, but uh, certainly interesting. It better define the population uh, who will likely benefit from this treatment. Next, this is another uh, way of showing this uh, this uh, benefit in terms of distance relapse relapse free survival. And you, what we you can see is that Prosigna is better to uh, differentiate the patients who will benefit and those who will not as compared to simply 
uh, immunohistochemistry, and this is true for DRFS, but also for overall survival. Next. And just to end this presentation, uh, we have uh, uh, new generation, I, I would say new generation trials uh, uh, where patient can be uh, selected by uh, PAM50, for instance. I, would, I, would, I will not uh, go into detail with all the trials, but for instance, in the K-Rich one trial, you have patients without uh, uh, her to her expression, but uh, but her to enriched tumors as defined by PIM50 and uh, uh, and and also sorry also her to positive tumors. But it, uh, in those patients, we have a combination of uh, uh, of immunotherapy and uh, anti her to uh, therapy, and in the neoadjuvant setting, and a very interesting uh, rate of PCR around uh, forty six percent. Um, and the, in the ECOG-Ocrine uh, uh, study, uh, also in triple negative breast cancer, uh, patients receiving uh, capcitabine or uh, platinum uh, in the post-neoadjuvant uh, setting. Uh, I, I can remind you that this study showed no difference and no benefit of platinum over, over capcitabine. And uh, also, uh, we have some uh, uh, interesting results coming from, uh, from PAM50 again, and in the particular subtype of non-basal patients. So uh, all, all this landscape to uh, show you the potential use of uh, PAM50 and other second generation sig molecular signature in the future to define uh, um, how many patients will benefit from new treatment strategies. Thank you. All right. Well, that was that was an excellent session. I think uh, really robust discussion during the cases as well. And great to hear everybody's thinking and, and see the audience participation. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in from the audience, and I think we have a few minutes to entertain a few of those. So what I uh, uh, first um, from uh, Dr. Harton, we have a question regarding um, would you consider prescri prescribing an endocrine therapy with an aromatase inhibitor as neoadjuvant challenge before surgery to maybe see a change in key 67? And, and I'll, I'll extend this a little bit for the purpose of discussion in, in you know, dynamic biomarkers for assessing response in the neoadjuvant setting. You know, where, where do you see that going? Perhaps uh, you know, would Persigna have a potential role there? But key 67 first, and Giles, Giles, if you want to go first. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know uh, uh, if my colleagues uh, have the same opinion, but uh, um, in in patients uh, uh, for whom we have uh, difficulties in prescribing uh, uh, chemotherapy and for whom we know that it will be difficult to uh, uh, to prescribe chemotherapy even in the adjuvant setting, I think it's uh, it's a treatment it's an attitude of choice and uh, it's very interesting. But also. Uh, uh, Despite we don't have uh, direct comparisons between neoadjuvant chemo and neoadjuvant hormone therapy, I think we have a sufficient number of data uh, showing that in selected patients with probably luminal A tumors, that's why PAM50 could be very useful. And uh, given that KI67 uh, is below, is, is inferior to 20%, uh, we can have this new adjuvant option. And uh, personally, I, I perform another biopsy, biopsy sorry, at uh, week two or week three. And uh, when it's, it's, it's beyond 2.7%, 2, 2. Uh, we know that we have a subgroup of patients with very good prognosis and, and for whom you can probably avoid chemotherapy. Frederick, I'm curious what you think, particularly from the technical aspects of key 67 and the reproducibility aspects and its role yes. as a dynamic marker. So um, in the, I'm part of the uh, key 67 international uh, group, and we have worked a lot to standardize uh, the way of uh, evaluating key 67. Uh, on the biopsy, it's, it's easier than on surgical specimen because you you don't have too, too much tissue to look at and you cannot, don't have to choose an area. But 
this uh, this option to um, to have a, like a window of uh, of um, a short treatment by aromatase inhibitor or monotherapy before surgery uh, is an option that has been chosen in Germany by many centers and. Uh, Nadia Arbeck uh, presented that uh, uh, at St. Galen and, and talked about that during St. Galen Congress. This could be uh, an, an option, I think. Uh, um, it could be interesting to see there is a change in the molecular signature also under the pressure of treatment because Gilles showed us um, uh, the profiling of uh, 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 metastatic breast cancer and the response to uh, uh, CD46 inhibitors, but we don't know what was uh, the profile of those patients before, you know, at early breast, if there is a change and things like that. So I think it could be an option, but it could be interesting to see uh, whether uh, there is, it could be a switch in the, in the subtype or is it only uh, a characterization maybe of a luminal A a phenotype. So it could be interesting to have a proof of concept, to have a kind of biologic proof behind behind this observation of a decrease of K67 that was used in, in many clinical trials, in particular in the German groups. Uh, Olivia, any, anything to add to us? Yeah, I, I'm not very comfortable with doing biopsy and re-biopsy and re-re-biopsy the patient to show if there is any way uh, uh, change or uh, you know, switch in the biology of the tumor because um, we are facing a challenge in our clinic is to manage a patient with maybe contraindication to the chemotherapy and this is the the the, the back the backbone of the discussion is that we are not able to do chemo for uh, an older patient. And uh, uh, in this situation, uh, I'm not very comfortable to re-biopsy the patient just to see if there is any change in the K67 or, or other signature. And um, um, probably uh, in, my, uh, in my routine uh, clinic, I, I will just perform one biopsy initially. Uh, and if it's a uh, luminal A breast cancer. Uh, I, I, I think endocrine therapy alone is a very reasonable uh, treatment option, uh, even if the tumor is a large tumor and we cannot uh, operate her on rapidly. So I think endocrine therapy alone is reasonable for luminal A breast cancer uh, and uh, intermediate risk uh, tumor, but we biopsy the patient on endocrine therapy. It's difficult, in my opinion. No, but uh, in the German in the German situation, they don't re biopsy the patient. They have surgery right after, so it's just uh, you know a short treat treatment of three weeks by endocrine yeah. treatment, and then there is surgery. So there is not a re biopsy. It's not the same thing as. Uh, the trial uh, 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 Gilles sh showed us with uh, PEPI score and things like that. Here it's it's different. It's it's really um, uh, um, pre uh, uh, the di diagnostic biopsy, uh, a short endocrine treatment, and then the surgery. And if there is a decrease, they consider that the patient uh, uh, can can avoid chemotherapy. Yes, it's it's the point uh, because uh, uh, we don't have a, a prosigna or PAM50 for uh, uh, for all our patients. And uh, if you don't have the inf if you have the information, uh, for instance, a luminal A tumor, I agree with Olivier. There is no no particular interest in in a biopsy. Uh, however, perhaps some luminal B patients and, and tumor can benefit from this strategy. For instance, if you have a KI 50, 67 at uh, 18, and then it's uh, it's below uh, 1% or 2%, perhaps uh, you, you can avoid chemotherapy. But it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a strategy which is not absolutely validated. It's I think it's an option in, in, in very particular situations. But do you agree that the, uh, the question behind that is, do we need chemo for those kind of patients. And if we consider luminal B intermediate risk as uh, a, a poor prognostic situation, that needs chemo. How can we integrate in our routine clinic this kind of data from this kind of study showing that uh, after two, three weeks of 
under the current therapy, we can avoid chemo. Uh, I think it will be difficult in in the future to understand the data from those kind of studies. Yeah, uh, but Olivier, perhaps in this situation, my, my answer would be certainly uh, your seventy two years old patients. You know, are our patients of seventy five years old for uh, seventy five year old patients. Uh, in those patients, you don't exactly know the value of chemo, and then you uh, you have this uh, dynamic uh, parameter. Yes, yeah, helping you to to take the decision, for instance. Okay. So we need to have those data to discuss further. Sure. Well, that was thank you all. That was that was uh, I think an excellent discussion of a complex and evolving topic uh, that we'll, we're certainly looking to engage in at, at Verisite and breast cancer as well. I, we are down at the bottom of the hour, so uh, out of respect for everyone's time, I, I think we'll. We'll go ahead and, and bring things to a close here. Just wanted to to point out that our next webinar will be uh, titled "How to Use ProSigna in Intermediate Patients." Address some today, but I think a, a complex topic and, and one that's worth going through in some detail. And then the subsequent meeting will focus on the economic benefits of ProSigna to a healthcare system, and will take place later in the year. Let's see. Yeah, it's on the next slide, but. So uh, we truly hope that uh, everyone's enjoyed this webinar and that you'll be able to join us for these upcoming uh, webinars as well. If you would like a copy of the slides uh, that have been presented, you can contact us via email at info at prosigna.com. Here we go. There it is. Uh, and the ProSigna assay is available and fully reimbursed in most major medical uh, healthcare systems. And as I hope you've seen as many benefits and should you wish to discuss how to order or use the assay, please uh, contact us via the details shown in the slide. Uh, we have local representatives who'd be delighted to talk to you. We recognize that switching practice is an important and difficult decision, but we hope that we have provided you with compelling reasons to do so. And we're here to help you every step of the way in that consideration. So I, I once again, want to thank uh, Professor Frederic Pinot-Dorca and, and Dr. Gilles Farrier and Dr. Olivier Trudon uh, for your remarkable insights uh, from your many years of research and practice. And uh, would like to also thank the audience for your attention and participation. And we very much look forward to uh, seeing you at our next meeting as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and close out.